Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Peter Bradford, Managing Director and CEO of IGO Limited. Peter Bradford joined IGO as, as its Managing Director and Chief Executive in March 2014. He's a metallurgist with over 35 years of experience in gold and base metal mining operations, exploration and development. Since being at the helm of IGO, Peter has guided the company through several landmark M&A deals and helped create significant value for shareholders. Two of these transactions were completed in the last quarter, transforming IGO into a leading battery materials focused business. But deal making hasn't distracted the team at IGO with its flagship Nova asset delivering strong returns and leaving the company with over half a billion in cash at your end. Peter's a strong advocate for ESG principles and sustainability, with IGO being one of only 12 mining companies globally in the S&P Sustainability Yearbook, which is an award that identifies the top 15% of high-performing sustainable companies. Please welcome Peter Bradford. Hi, everyone, and thank you. It's great to be here once again. Uh, talking to you about IGO at the Diggers and Dealers Mining Forum. And the first thing I really want to do is, is thank the organisers for what's shaping up to be another fantastic forum, and uh, as it should be for the 30th year anniversary. And IGO are really proud to have been part of that journey for many of those uh, 30 years. And once again, we're really proud to be helping to facilitate beaming this, uh, these presentations to the world uh, via the, the broadband that's being bounced off our exploration premises here in Kalgoorlie, and we're doing that in collaboration with Diggers and Dealers and Corp Cloud. So fantastic to be involved there. The main theme of this presentation today is going to be on transformation. And if you Google it, or if you look it up in the Cambridge Dictionary, you'll find that transportation is a complete change in the character or appearance of someone or something, and generally for the better. And uh, that's exactly what we've been doing at IGO over the last year, the last four years, and even the last seven years. We've been through a process of enduring transformation, uh, and we have transformed our portfolio and transformed the, uh, the outlook for the business from a financial perspective. We've worked with people in the business to understand what sort of company they wanted to work for, and, and to make, the make IGO the place that we're all proud to work, and we've transformed our culture. And we have worked to continuously improve our ESG and our sustainability practices and reporting, to take a leading posture and to transform our ESG brand. And that's the, uh, the, the, the story of IGO over the last seven years uh, mapped out on this chart. You know, seven years ago, we were a billion dollar company with a couple of smaller, uh, short mine life, but high quality uh, base metals mines and a 30% interest in the Tropicana gold mine. And today, you know, we have a, a unique portfolio of uh, nickel, copper, lithium and cobalt, all produced here in Western Australia, a tier one mining jurisdiction and, and a, uh, an extensive uh, uh, portfolio of belt scale exploration projects focused on the discovery of the next generation of nickel and copper mines. As a purpose-led business, our, our purpose, making a difference, and the accompanying narrative talk about who we are, uh, what we do, and why we do it. And why we do it is our belief in, the, in a green energy future and our belief that we can make a contribution to a better planet and that we can make a contribution to reversing some of the trends of, uh, of uh, climate change by producing those metals that are, that are critical to enabling clean energy. And that conversation around climate change has been going on for many, many years. And, and over the last 12 to 18 months, that conversation, the volume of it, has really dialed up. And I put a large part of that down to COVID. COVID hit pause on the planet. You know, we paused power production, we paused industry, and we paused transportation. And as a result, we all got a at an opportunity to see a glimpse of what could be. And places around the world that haven't seen uh, clean air in a, in a generation were able to see blue skies. And that's allowed all of us to visualise what could be possible and how we could 
make a difference for future generations. And with that, we've seen significant stimulus dollars uh, around the world from many, many governments go into uh, renewable energy uh, opportunities and uh, electrification of transport, and we've seen a huge groundswell of corporate activity increasing their efforts towards decarbonisation. That uh, desire to have an impact, to create a better planet for future generations, is embedded in our purpose. It's also been embedded in our strategy. Our strategy is to be a globally relevant supplier of clean energy metals, and we want a diverse suite of products made safely, ethically, sustainably and reliably. We want to be customer focused, connecting with end users through vertical integration and we want to be carbon neutral. All of this delivered by people who are bold, passionate, fearless and fun. A smarter, kinder, more innovative team. I've been rambling on about clean energy, making the assumption that everyone knows what I'm talking about. For us, Clean energy metals are all about the metals you need to make renewable energy generation happen, so solar and wind. The metals you need to make energy storage possible, grid-scale energy storage or home energy storage to, to trap that rooftop solar, and also uh, the metals that make electric vehicles possible. And it's really electric vehicles that capture the minds of the individuals and, uh, and also provide the opportunity to put another car photo in the presentation. And um, you know, that uh, electric vehicles, you know, last year, 4.2% of light vehicles globally uh, were electric vehicles. And that's going to get bigger in a hurry because all of the OEMs are shifting their, their book from internal combustion engines into electric vehicles. And next year, believe it or not, there will be 450 electric vehicle models globally. We don't see many of them in Australia, but 450 million globally. And that's driving this shift in, in the, the outlook for lithium-ion battery demand. And that's all underpinned by passenger vehicles, but also includes you know, pa uh, um, uh, commercial vehicles, bikes, buses, uh, and even the consumer electronics. And this projection here from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and there's a cottage industry of projections, but this one talks to a five times increase in demand for lithium ion batteries. So that's a 25% compound annual growth rate, 25%. Now, if you were in any business on the planet where your, your market was growing by 25% per annum, it'd be happy days. And, uh, and that could be wrong. You, know, you look at the technology adoption in recent times, using solar PV as an example, reality has always outperformed analyst projections. And each year the analysts reprojected higher, and each year again reality outperformed it. And we're starting to see that emerge in the, in the uh, fully battery electric vehicle space. Last year, the, uh, sorry, year to date this year to the end of April, 166% uh, uh, improvement on last year. Over the last six years, 55% compound annual growth rate. So reality, you know, early days, reality is outpacing analysts' expectations. But let's stick to those Bloomberg New Energy Finance numbers and look at what that means for metals uh, using the 25% CAGR. And, and you see it there. You know, and as you would expect, if you increase the number of lithium-ion batteries by five times, Generally, the amount of metal you need goes up by five times as well. And that's exactly what we see on the chart, plus or minus some small shifts because of changing battery chemistries. And if you single out just one of those, say nickel. Nickel, the market's about 2.7 million tonnes per annum. And last year, the nickel into lithium-ion batteries was about 250,000 tonnes, so just under 10% of the market. And by 2030, that's expected to be 1.3 million tonnes. So a million tonnes of growth by the end of the decade. That's huge. The question we need to be asking is, where is this metal going to come from? And that's just with the analyst estimates. Reality could be bigger than that. At IGO, we produce nickel, copper, cobalt and lithium. And those four metals represent 55% of the metals that go into a lithium-ion battery. And to my knowledge, we're the only company go globally that produces that uh, one-stop shop uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, electric vehicle battery metals.
So let's shift gears and, and talk about um, the, the year that was, FY21. You know, we divested Tropicana. We invested in a lithium joint venture with Tianchi. We delivered outstanding operational performance at Nova, and that reflected in outstanding financial metrics across the business. And you see those laid out on the page here. Record revenue, record net profit after tax, record free cash flow, and record net cash at bank at the end of the year. And we had a lot of noise in our financial numbers during the year, you know, with the, uh, the payments for the Tianchi joint venture and the receipts for Tropicana. But just to give you a sense of the underlying business, we've stripped all of that noise out, and this reflects what the underlying business is doing. The main, the main story in our numbers was Nova. You know, once again, Nova delivered a beat on, uh, on all three uh, 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 metals that we produce, nickel, copper, and cobalt, all above the top end of our guidance range, and our cash costs were well below our, our cash cost guidance range for the year. And, in, and we continue to be the lowest cost nickel producer in Australia, and Nova uh, delivered a record free cash flow for the year, $390 million and change. An, an outstanding effort by the Nova team, and, and, and when we talk about Nova team, it's broad. It's the IGO people that work there, it's the Barminko people that work there, it's the Cater Care people that work there, the Bureau Veritas, and, and all of those people contribute to delivering our, our continuing success at Nova, and we thank all of you. Guidance going forward, we expect a softening of grade going into FY22 and a further softening uh, going into FY23 and then we plateau at that level. Like many in the industry, we're also seeing some cost pressures. You know, we're projecting higher oil prices, we're projecting higher costs for ocean freight, uh, we're projecting higher royalties because commodity prices are so good and we're also projecting higher people costs because of those, uh, that tightness in the labour market that we all see. But we're not just going to take all of those standing still. We continue to focus on how we can continue to optimise and maximise the business, how we can continue to collaborate with Barminko to, to roll out smart solutions underground uh, to improve safety, improve productivity and reduce costs, and how we can do exactly the same on surface and how we can uh, uh, improve our flotation recoveries. As we all know, if you improve your flotation recovery, it's free money. I'm not going to talk a lot about Tropicana. Um, you know, we completed the transaction to divest uh, in, uh, in May, and, and we did that for two reasons. Number one, you know, it, it completes our transition to become 100% focused on clean energy metals. And number two, it provided a critical part of the, uh, the funding that we needed for the lithium investment. And, uh, and it meant that we didn't have to use the $1.1 billion of debt facilities that our team uh, put in place in late 2020. That sale reflects a, um, a, uh, uh, the end of a very successful collaboration with Anglo Gold Ashanti over nearly 20 years. And through that time, you know, we've been hugely impressed by the uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti uh, leadership team, the operating team. They've done a wonderful job through the journey through exploration, feasibility studies, construction, commissioning, and then eight years of operations. And we take this opportunity to thank them for that collaboration. I know you're all here. Mike Erickson and team, thank you very much. And we wish you and Regis all the very best in your ongoing partnership in the future. So we use that money. Um, and some more that we had, to invest in this uh, 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 joint venture with Tianchi to form a global lithium joint venture. And right now that global joint venture has got two assets in it and they're both here in Western Australia. But importantly, they're world class, vertically integrated lithium assets. And uh, what that means is we've got a 25% interest in the Greenbushes mine, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but needless to say, it's the world's lowest cost, highest grade hard rock lithium mine on the planet. And we also get a 49% interest in the Quinana lithium hydroxide refinery, which is the first fully automated lithium hydroxide uh, plant in the world. So digging down a little bit on green bushes, I think everyone knows where green bushes is. Mining's been going on there since the 1800s. First tin, then tantalum, now lithium, and we've been producing spodumene at, at green bushes for a couple of, of decades. 
we actually produce two different types of spodumene, a technical grade, which goes to very bespoke customers, and, and that's not reflected in this chart here, and we produce a chemical grade, uh, which, which goes into the, uh, the lithium uh, salts that you need for a, a electric vehicle batteries. And there's two plants there at the moment that produce that chemical grade, total installed capacity about 1.2 million tonnes per annum of spodumene concentrate, and over the coming years we expect to double that capacity. First with the tailings retreatment project, uh, uh, where, which will add about three, uh, 300,000 tonnes of production uh, with commissioning next year, and then a, a potential third and fourth concentrator commissioning in 2024 and 2027. If you can imagine when all of that is up and running, we'll have a 20-year reserve life. Right? And we'll have on top of that probably another five or seven years of resource life from the parallel Kapanga uh, pit. Today, most of that uh, spodumene concentrate, IGO uh, uh, Tianchi's share, goes to China for processing in Tianchi's plants, and that's sold to them at a transfer price. Uh, but going forward, as we commission the uh, Quinana lithium hydroxide refinery, that spodumene will start going here. There's two trains uh, at various stages uh, at Quinana, and the first of those stages is fully constructed, and we're in the process of commissioning now, and we expect to produce first lithium hydroxide in the coming months. There's a second train. Uh, the, the construction activity on it is currently on hold, and we would expect to restart that construction activity in 2022, and then to be commissioning that second train uh, in, in early 2024. That would give us an installed capacity of 48,000 tonne per annum of battery grade uh, lithium hydroxide that goes to uh, uh, markets in South Korea and, and Europe, and 100% of train one production is, is sold. Longer term, there's the opportunity, and there is the supply from green bushes to build a train three and four, doubling production through to 96,000 tonne per annum. Sustainability and ESG, capture so many elements. You know, it's people, it's safety and well-being, there's environment, there's uh, uh, decarbonisation, there's community, traditional owners, business continuity. And over the last um, few years, IGO has been working really hard to continuously improve the practices across all of those areas and, and, and to continuously improve how we report it. We published our first sustainability report in, uh, in 2015, and we'll publish our sixth sustainability report late in at the end of this month. As we've, as we've improved the quality of what we do and how we report it, we've attracted uh, global recognition. And uh, Mark has talked to some of that global recognition before, and, and the rest is on the page. In last year's sustainability report, we talked to uh, our response to climate change, and we talked about our aspiration to be carbon neutral by 2035. Since then, and over the last year, we've worked to build the roadmap and the plan as to how we deliver that, and, and uh, just recently we've committed to the adoption of an internal carbon price that'll, uh, that'll generate the funds internally that can be used to fund uh, scope one and two uh, uh, emissions abatement programs, but also fund the investment in, in offset programs. And we've also committed to understanding our upstream and downstream scope three emissions and collaborating with our partners there to create different and better outcomes. We'll, we'll lay out our, our, our roadmap in greater detail in our sustainability report, which comes out at the end of this month. We've got a good, strong balance sheet. We remain growth focused. Um, we are constructive around further uh, disciplined and accretive M&A. We're constructive around further value add through vertical integration and downstream, and we maintain our conviction uh, for discovery. And, uh, We've got, a, as I said earlier, a portfolio of belt-scale projects right across the western part of uh, uh, Australia where we're focused on nickel uh, and copper uh, exploration, uh, high-value magmatic nickel sulphide deposits and high-value sediment-hosted copper deposits. My view is we've got the best-in-class team on the job and we're applying the very best science available to us. 
We've committed a budget again this year of $65 million to exploration, and the large part of that goes into NOVA, $33 million into NOVA and the Fraser Range, where we're seeking to leverage off the, the work we've done over the last few years to develop that unique understanding of the geological setting and the controls to mineralisation. We've also got $17 million going into the Patterson, where we're starting with a clean sheet of paper and where we're doing the work to do the data capture geologically, geophysically and, and, and geochemically to generate the next generation of targets uh, for drilling in 2023. I wanted to close by talking about people. You know, people are our number one resource at, at IGO. Everything I've talked about, it's our people that make that happen and our people, we want their experience at IGO to be the highlight of their career and we want to be developing them um, while they're with IGO and we want to make sure they become the very best that they can be and, we, and, and like in the short to medium term, you know, the first prize for me is seeing them broaden into different roles or elevate and be promoted to, to, to new opportunities but long term, you know, my aspiration is that we'll see an IGO uh, uh, alumni running many, many mining companies at a, at a future uh, diggers and dealers. So ladies and gentlemen, everyone, um, to conclude, it's been a great year. Two transformative uh, uh, transactions, which mean we're now 100% focused on clean energy metals, continue, continued strong operational and financial performance, and we continue to invest in, in the future. We invest in our people, we invest in exploration, we invest in ESG, and we invest in our climate change response. Before moving to Q&A, I just wanted to make one other comment. We've gone through a process of board renewal, continual board renewal over the last few years, and uh, on the 1st of July, we appointed a new chair, uh, Mike Nossel, and, and Peter Bilby, who's been our chair for many, many years, and has led the company through this strate strategic transformation uh, Peter will be leaving us at the uh, AGM in November later this year. And I just want to take this opportunity, given that this, his last um, uh, Diggers and Dealers where he wears a, officially wears an IGO uh, uh, badge, uh, that uh, we thank Peter for his contributions to IGO and, and I personally thank him for all his guidance uh, during my tenure so far at IGO. Thank you. Well done, Peter. Great presentation. Okay, could I see um, any questions for Peter? There must be some questions for Peter in the audience. I not see any there. Okay, I've got a couple here on the email. I'll kick off with that and please put your hand up if you'd like to ask Peter. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer the questions there. Peter, you're clearly um, a very supportive of the electrification of transport. Uh, comments from you on Australia and whether we're lagging and uh, what, what, what more can be done? Yep, sure. Like I think the numbers I used, 2020 was 4.2% electric vehicles globally uh, uh, as a proportion of light vehicles. Australia in 2020 was about 0.7. So we're, just as we are with uh, COVID-19 vaccinations, you know, we're behind the eight ball with, uh, with a take up of electric vehicles as well. And we're not seeing now, in many other jurisdictions, we're seeing a combination of carrot and stick to incentivise the transition. We're not really seeing any of the carrot and stick in, in Australia. There were no incentives when I bought my electric vehicle, and I'm not seeing the rollout of the, the aggressive rollout of infrastructure that we could have that gets rid of the range anxiety which stops many, many people from turning to an electric vehicle. So I think there's much more that could be done, uh, uh, particularly in this year where government is looking for great stimulus projects uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to stimulate the economy. Thank you. Um, another one that's come through on the email is the move to ESG and sustainable mining has been a key thematic over the past few years. How do mining companies differentiate between, between being green and just greenwashing? As you would have seen from our presentation, you know, for us, ESG, decarbonisation, it's actually embedded in our purpose. You know, it's, it's, it's embedded in our DNA, it's who we're about. And, uh, and, uh, you know, that's, um, and, I, and I would expect if we, if we went out and reached out to many of the other mining companies in the room, it would be exactly the same. And uh, we all need to be serious about it and, and we can all together 
make a difference and, and truly create a better planet for future generations. That's great. We've got one more question here that came through on the email. I think this is going to be an easy one for you. How do you feel about IGO hitting an all-time share price high last week? Yay! <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, but more to come, right? All right, of course, yeah. I went to see Mark Creasy last week and he was asking me when we we're going to get to $20. So <laughs> there you go. OK. Thank you. Nothing more from the audience? OK, thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen.